joining us on the I Love Seville show. It's great to connect with you on every social media and podcasting platform possible, a show that tries its best. I think we do a fairly good job to just talk about a community that we love, Charlottesville, Almoral County, and Central Virginia. Just because we hold the community accountable and ask a very I don't know, analytical, I think fair, maybe targeted uh, questions and, and try to challenge the narrative does not mean we don't have a deep passion for Charlottesville and Almoral County. My wife and I are, are raising our two boys here. We live in the county of Almoral and we work 60 hours a week, 70 hours a week in the city of Charlottesville. Um, there would be nothing more that I would like, and I don't want to put the pressure on them because they're six and nearly two years old, that they continued um, this business and it turned into maybe what Charlottesville Sanitary Supply has, Judah a 60-year business. We'll give some love to our partners, Charlottesville Sanitary Supply on East High Street, 60 consecutive years of business. That's absolutely amazing. John Vermillion's parents started it 60 years ago after moving from Richmond with an idea of opening a sanitary supply store. Today, that business is being passed from the second generation, Mr. John Vermillion, who I have tremendous respect for, to his son, Andrew Vermillion. Charlottesville Sanitary Supply, now with a fantastic e-commerce website online at charlottesvillesanitarysupply.com. Judah, today's interview is an exciting one. Um, a This is really the reason we have our business downtown, is this happens all the time. I'll set the stage of what happened. Was it yesterday? Two, two days, days ago, ago, I think, yeah. Two days ago. I am walking out of the post office where we've had a P.O. box for, I don't know, 15 years. And as I'm walking out of the post office back to the studio on 4th and Market, um, a gentleman um, says, hi, Jerry. Um, and I stop and I say hi back. And this brief conversation leads to a Facebook message thread. And today, 48 hours later, we have an interview that I think you, the viewer and listener, is going to find extremely compelling. Phil Reese is in the house. He's a, an entrepreneur and a business owner. His brand is one I want you to patronize, Unlocked History Escape Rooms. He has spent 16 years in the defense sector, including seven years at Rivana Station north of town. I'm going to try to ask him some questions on what he thinks the true economic impact. We know it's $1.3 billion. That's what the white paper commissioned by the Chamber of Commerce, Almore County, Greene County, and the city of Charlottesville in conjunction with Weldon Cooper um, assessed, a $1.3 billion yearly impact. But maybe we can get a little more details on that. We're also going to talk tourism. We're going to talk what it's like to run a business locally, whether this is a community that's, that's, that's welcoming to launching a business, challenges, trials, and tribulations. Grab your iced coffee, your hot tea, whatever your drink of choice is and sit back and, and enjoy. Judah, if we can go to the studio camera and then a two-shot. Phil Reese, you are now on camera. We're going to start with the question. We start with every guest. Sure. Introduce yourself to the folks that are watching the program. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me in today. Our pleasure. It was a, kind of a pleasant surprise to kind of uh, go from a hello on the downtown mall yeah. to being invited to come into your show. So, uh, so thank you for that. Yeah, so my name is Phil Reese. Uh -huh. Owner of Unlocked History Escape Rooms, we started, I guess officially the business started in 2017, but we opened our first escape room in 2018. Um, it was a, uh, it's a Monticello, Thomas Jefferson themed escape room, so very local history. Um, so we've been going on for about six years now. Um, you know, so I've been running this business as a side business for about four or five years. Um, trying to get it to a point where I could do it full time. Okay. And about uh, so I I was able to get a leave of absence at my old job, okay. the Defense Intelligence Agency. Um, um, been an intelligence officer there for 16 years, so I was able to get a one year leave of absence, you know, unpaid, and allowed me to kind of test my foot in. Can I do this full time? Can I make enough money? Uh -huh. Can it also be you know efficient enough where my wife and I can depend on this this income for for our uh, Pay your you know, bills. Pay our bills. Yeah. You know, have a life. Yeah. I got, I got three kids. Wow. Uh, 12, three. 11, and Good three. For you. you know, I kind of have a little similar <laughs> dream as you and your kids, as, uh, and same with the sanitary supply with, uh, you know, uh, hopefully one day, you know, you don't want to force them into it, but hopefully one day, either my son, my one of my two daughters, or perhaps more than one uh, might decide to carry on this business, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now. So we'll see. We'll see. I Over the summer... My two kids, they were helping me. We, we did this like 3D printer stuff for some of these new props for this new escape room that's yeah. coming out. Those are cool, the 3D printers. Yeah. You know, it, uh, it, A, it saves money, it saves time, but it's also, you know, allows us to build some sturdier props too. So, uh, 
So that was my first, that was my son and daughter's first dabble in actually helping the business. So okay. pretty excited about that. But uh, yeah, glad to be here, Jay. And it's great to have you. I have so many questions. Um, Where do you why, want to start? Why escape rooms? Why escape rooms? So um, let me take you back to, let's say, 2014. So I was work, still working for DIA. Okay. I was working at AFRICOM. That's, okay. uh, that's Africa Command. So that's the U.S. Okay. military's headquarters for all things Africa. So that's located in Stuttgart, Germany. Back in 2014, 2015, escape rooms were brand new. So okay. it's, still, it's still a relatively new industry. Um, but we were traveling to Prague, Czech Republic, and I was looking on TripAdvisor for things to do. And, you know, number one thing on this list was this thing called escape rooms. And, I, you know, I was very curious. What is this? <coughs> How old are you at this time? How old are you now? Can I so ask I'm you that I'm 40 years old. Okay. Uh, this man's aging well here. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Yeah, okay. I didn't appreciate it when I was 18. and you're I looked, getting carded all the time. Yeah, you know, you know I was... <coughs> I looked four or five years younger than, than what I did for many years, but now I'll take it. But uh, yeah, we were, so we tried an escape room. My wife and I, my son was maybe one or two years old and uh, it, it wasn't the best escape room, but it was a lot of fun. It was brand new. And I, I knew at the time that I want, when, when we moved back to the U S I knew I wanted to start a business. I don't know if it was going to be real estate investment or what, but I knew, you know, you kind of get that itch. <coughs> There's just something that just sort of that drive, and, uh, and I had that, and okay. I just didn't know what the industry would be. But when we did that first escape room, the light bulb went off, and uh, so I started preparing for it. I, I still had another year or two in Germany to kind of finish my tenure there. And uh, when we were moving back, you know, I had a choice. I, I had partial choice. Uh, moved back to D.C., where we where I originally was working at DIA. You know, they have other locations, Tampa, um, Colorado. Mm -hmm. But Charlottesville was the number one on my list. It was like the perfect size city for what I was hoping to do with an escape room. So not a huge city where there'd be a ton of competition. Um, but I also knew, you know, a small business owner, you don't know if it's going to work out. So I just wanted to kind of lower risk, like rent's a little cheaper here <coughs> compared to D.C. Um, but we, I was successful in moving to D.C. and uh, shortly afterwards started the business. And uh, um, yeah, I guess I, I, I worked on it as a side business for four or five years until I could do it full time. So the viewers and listeners, bear with me as I'm fighting a cold for my two-year-old. I'm literally, I don't think I've ever done this on the show before, taking cough syrup live <laughs> during an interview um, on the show. Mm. Down the hatch. Okay. I have so many questions here. So you go from the Defense Intelligence Agency where, maybe I'll ask you this question. You don't have to give me the answer. I would imagine you're co compensated and extremely well. Yeah, I, I, I would say so. so I, I'll be, you know, I'll be open with it. I, so I would, I've been a GG 13. And so for folks who have not been, I have in no idea what service, that means. Yeah. So there's different like pay grades. Okay. So it's either called the GS or GG. Mm -hmm. I won't okay. get into the differences, but, uh, it's a GG 13, which is basically an analyst without supervisor management, uh, it's one step below supervisory management. Okay. Um, and so, but uh, I guess maybe about three years ago, I did go into the, I become a supervisory intelligence officer. So I had a branch under me of, I don't know, five to seven analysts. Um, but uh, yeah, so a GG13 in Charlottesville. Right now, I looked it up this morning because okay. I thought this would be a good t topic to discuss. A GG13 um, in Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. At uh, step one, which basically it's your first year as a GG13, it makes about $100,000. Okay. So let me put a perspective and throw it back to you. Yeah. Um, 2023 HUD median average household family income, 124200 This is 2023 number, HUD, their number, average median family household income. This is, could be combined income mm -hmm. for a family. 124,200. So you said your that comp, that number of compensation was right now? So yeah, so in 2013 me personally yeah. was making, you know, I I was like a step 5, so I was making about 120 okay. maybe 125,000. I don't remember exactly what it there was. There you go. I would say the average salary at Injic and DIA. Yeah. Um which probably be closer to 90,000, you know, cuz you're going to have some junior analysts and, and so forth. So, these are pretty good well-paying jobs. You know, you're not going to get super rich. Yeah. But you're not going to you're not going to be wanting either. Sure. You know, you can afford you can afford decent housing. Yeah. It's a you know, it's just a typical typical middle class. Yeah. 
uh, income, but it's a healthy income. And they sure. combine potentially with a partner or Absolutely. spouse's income. Yeah. And you can see how this particular family is significantly ahead of the median family household income, Charlottesville metro area. I'm going to throw it back to you. I'm going to add a little color first. I mentioned the Northrop Grumman facility coming to Waynesboro, about a quarter million dollar facility, quarter billion, mm. 200 to 250 million the Falls Church company is going to spend. They're going to hire three, 300 engineers and manufacturers and Average annual salary for this Waynesboro facility of ninety four thousand. So a little bit more color here. I'll follow your lead here. Yeah, I yeah. find your commentary compelling. Well, here. I think you know. Here's the so that is a healthy salary, but I also give it a little perspective of what um, you know. So Injek, pretty much all the, all of Injek is located in Charlottesville, with okay. a few exceptions. Okay, but you know, ninety eight percent of their employees are here in Charlottesville at Ravana Station. DIA is different. Um, okay. DIA, it's located all around the world. We're, we are the intelligence. A lot of times when you hear Pentagon intelligence, it's DIA. DIA is essentially Pentagon intelligence. But as I mentioned, it's, we were in, I worked in Germany. So that's sort of the headquarters for Africa. Headquarters for the Middle East is in Tampa. Headquarters for Europe is also in Germany. Um, headquarters for NORTHCOM, which is basically the North, uh, North America, that's in Colorado. And then, of course, you have the headquarters for DIA, which is probably 60% of the, of, the of the workforce for DIA is up in D.C. But in D.C., obviously the cost of living is more. Um, and so when the government, they save, the, the DIA and the government saves a lot of money when they essentially have the good portions of their workforce in cheaper cost of living areas. So Charlottesville is, one, is, is, is kind of perfect because A, they say 15% on payroll right off the top because of the cost of living is cheaper here than DC. But because we're just two hours away from DC, you know, if I need to go brief, or, again, this is my previous job, not anymore, but if I needed a brief at the Pentagon or at headquarters or you know, the State Department or something like that, I can get up, it's, it's, a, it's a long day, get mm -hmm. up at five, travel two hours, go do the briefing, do some meetings, and I can come back and have dinner with my kids. So it's kind of a perfect spot for INJIC and DIA. Allows the government to save money, but it still allows them to kind of do, when they do need to be in the D.C. area, they can do that just as a day trip. You don't have to do a hotel, mm -hmm. don't mm -hmm. have to do lodging, mm -hmm. don't have to do per diem for the most part. You still do some mileage, but it saves the government a lot of money to have uh, have. A good portion of the workforce here. Uh, you got questions and comments coming already um, quickly. Um, John Blair on LinkedIn, tell Philip that our son had a birthday party at his business and the kids absolutely loved it. What a great entrepreneur this man is. That's from John Blair over Thank on you, John. LinkedIn. Steven's watching on one of our Facebook pages and he says, the escape room that they offer is excellent for kids. Jerry, on yesterday's show, you were talking about stuff to do for kids. Here's a perfect thing to do. Andrew Sides, um, giving you some props right now. Viewers and listeners, if you want to give the man some love, put your comments in the feed. I'll relay it live on air. We'll also highlight, um, is it Gene Anderson Coy? Um, yeah. Sean Mandelcorn, uh, giving you some props yep. right now. Multiple states watching the show. Why does a man, Logan Wells Kalelo, hello. Vanessa Parkill, hello. Why is a man that's got a, uh, uh, a lot of, and I think I know the answer to this, vertical potential, earning potential, job security, jump out of that path into entrepreneurship in Charlottesville, <laughs> Albemarle, and Central Virginia? So I, I absolutely loved my job as an intelligence okay. officer. I mean, it took me, you know, I got to see the world. I, you know, I started off right out of college, went to Syracuse University, and within a year, for better or for worse, but I, for me it was better, I got to deploy to Iraq, right? Okay. So right off the bat, you kind of feel like you're doing something for the country. You know, I, I decided to get in this business because of 9-11. You know, that had a deep impact on me. And, uh, you know, I've got to work with our partners and allies all over the world, and that is a fun job. But uh, the reason why I made the switch is because there, if you have the drive for it, there is nothing like being able to work for yourself. You know, I like to say that I work twice as hard and I make half the pay. <laughs> but uh, now, you know, the benefit of a business is the ceiling is a lot higher, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there it is. The you know, with the government. I loved it, but you know it is a you know, it is a huge bureaucracy, uh -huh. 
and it, you know, it can get frustrating. I, I'm, I went from the largest employer in the U.S., the Department of Defense, to essentially the smallest employer myself, right? Mm -hmm. um, but just sort of the autonomy, the independence, to be able to take a day off and I don't have to ask permission mm -hmm. from somebody. Um, and frankly, just the excitement to come into work on Monday mornings, you can't put a price on that. And of course, I want the business, you know, the, the business is making enough money where we can very comfortably live on. Um, but it's not a business I'm probably going to get super wealthy off of, but it is a, it is a much more fulfilling uh, work for me. And again, I, I love my job, but I love, the, I love being a business owner and specifically a business owner of an escape room business. I get to make... I get to make fun escape rooms. Like I kind of view it as like a movie director where I get to create my own 100%. stories. Yeah. You know, I, I have a I have an Edgar Allan Poe themed room. So I get to really delve into Edgar Allan Poe and his stories and his time at UVA. So uh -huh. I kind of use the local history. I did a World War II spy escape room. Um, obviously I use my background as an intelligence officer. Uh, to, uh, to, to make the puzzles for that. It's got an Enigma machine and a telegraph, so you actually get to play with these things in the escape room. And now the newest one that we're opening here next Friday, uh, a week from tomorrow. Are these the photos that we should put yeah, on screen? Yeah, you can, you can if you put them on screen? post those photos, Judah. It's, it's, those are about 90% done because we're putting the finishing touches on this escape room, but it is a Leonardo da Vinci-themed escape room. That's so, awesome. No, it's going to take place in 1502. Okay. Uses all, of, you know, we have, we have like 12 of his paintings that okay. we use uh, in the escape room. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of like Indiana Jones type movies, you know, where there's some sort, sort of secrets with this type of historical stuff or paintings or, you know, that type of thing. So it's so much fun to, for Da Vinci. I was looking at all of his paintings and uh, I'll give a little hint to, to one of our puzzles Da Vinci was so fascinated with, he would, so many times he would have paintings of people pointing. Okay. Right? He was just fascinated by drawing and painting the hand. Uh huh. So I can make a puzzle out of that. I have like nine or ten of his paintings and they're going to point to something significant. So okay. I'll leave it at that. But okay. just something simple where you can kind of take that history and make a fun puzzle out of it. And so it is, it is a really fun job. I, I'm fascinated by this um, uh, personal and professional evolution. Uh, do you have uh, a game plan to potentially try to scale the business to multiple locations and or franchise? Because I can already <laughs> tell with your uh, makeup, your DNA, that you're a, a, a big picture guy. Um, if you haven't read the book E-Myth Mastery. I have read uh, that, I've, yeah. Of course you've read yeah. the book. Um, I, anybody who's a business owner should read the book E-Myth Mastery. Just a tip and a suggestion there. How do you scale this business? What's your plan? I know you have one. So we are actually in the process. The, this new escape room is actually stage two of scaling this. So, okay. you know, as I mentioned, we're on Allied Lane. Yeah. We, have one, we, we have had one space, but we, when we finished our third escape room, that's all the space we had. Okay. And uh, fortunately, the building right next door became open for lease right as I finished that third escape room. And, you know, I was... Talking to my wife. My wife helps me with this business, too. She's there every day uh, building these things. We kind of hemmed and hawed, and, uh, but we just decided to lease the space next door. So it kind of doubled our size. Okay. Um, and so this business, we're at escape room number four. We have room for seven escape rooms. Okay. So we're going to build a one. It's usually been taking me two years on a part-time basis to build one escape room. Now that I'm working full-time, um, my wife is working uh, part-time to full-time, and I'm starting to hire more staff okay. who are actually helping design these. So we can build these faster. Okay. Um, so we will eventually have seven escape rooms, hopefully in about three years. Okay. And at that point, it's sort of fully scaled out. We will probably change over and switch some of our earlier escape rooms uh -huh. to, to new ones. Okay. Um, but at that point, I definitely, it's sort of open. Okay. So... Because at that point, you've done proof of performance. Yes. You've... you've um, Shown that the concept can work, you have data, you have uh, years of P&Ls, um, you show that the concept can work. And at that point, you're almost at a crossroads. Yeah, you know, look, we, we are cash flow positive, yeah. which we should be at this point. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the big costs are payroll and rent. Sure. And so right now, the rent is not going to go up more as I build more escape rooms. Sure. So, Woodard family, your landlord. Yes. Okay. Yep. And I'm, ha I'm happy with them. Um, so... 
certainly becomes more profitable the more escape rooms we have. And then what's next? I don't know. I, uh, it becomes more profitable because your, your labor is essentially fixed. Yeah. And you're able to monetize multiple times in a given an hour. Yeah. Because you have more. Dude, I, I love this can, model. I love this model here. Well, I'm getting excited. You know, the, one of the reasons why I like this business a lot, there, sure. there are certainly upfront capital costs to building an escape room. Yeah. Right? But once you have it built, you know, look, escape rooms are not the cheapest thing. I'll be the first one. It is, you know, it's, it's about $32 a person. I get, get it. It's not, it's, it's not available to everybody. Okay. We're trying to find ways to make it cheaper on certain days. We're, we're working through some ideas. But... You know, Thirty-two dollars a person for how long? For one hour. Okay. For okay. one hour, and but but the the benefit of the business is, unless they break something, there's really no cost except the staff that I'm paying and exactly. my, my overhead. Yeah. So it's not like you're we're not we're not creating merchandise, we're not selling food. So there's not some of those standard fixed costs. And the staff consists of a gatekeeper at the front, a check-in person, right? Yeah. It, it consists of a what we call them a game master or host. Okay. So they're the ones. That invite them in, uh-huh. but they're also monitoring them over a camera, right. over a microphone. If they okay. need a hint, they'll push some hints okay. to them. Their number one job is to make sure they have they have fun, okay. and hopefully be successful. Okay. You know, people people enjoy escape rooms a lot more if they finish the escape room because they get to see all the puzzles and so forth. So we try uh, to have most groups be successful. It's just more fun that way. Um, so the game master is in charge, just making sure that they're having fun. Kirk Bigger, give you some props right now. You got a radio station watching you, you here. Rob Neal says, "I took a team of ten there as part of a corporate team building day. This is a great option for team building that will provide good takeaways and team dynamic observations." Uh, Rob Neal, thank you for watching the program. Thank you, Rob. A lot of folks, uh, a lot of folks watching you here. Let me let me throw this to you. The labor piece. Have you been found? Have you found it challenging to fill labor? Because so, a lot of people are saying that right now. Yes and no. I, here's one advantage we have f- compared to, I think, other companies. It is, I think it's a more fun job to have. Like, so we're competing against maybe a restaurant or you know, someone working at a Walmart, that type of thing. And so you're coming, uh, you're hosting, and people are coming here to have fun. So it is, I think it's a fun job to have, and it's not, it's not tiring, like physically tiring. I think the tiring part is... You know, if we're busy, you know, it's going to be group after group after group, right? So it's just sort of, it's tiring in that way. But we don't have a hard time getting applicants. That's not the, that's not the hard part. But, you know, not everyone is suited to be a game master. So we want, we're looking for bubbly personalities, people who are able to create rapport with, with folks, people who are easy to talk with too, and can handle you know, a 60-year-old grandfather and an 8-year-old kid and be able to, 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 to relate to them in, in a positive way. Um, so I think it is getting easier to find labor, but we do have a big advantage. It's a fun job to have compared to other ones in the same, the, the same pay scale, I would say. Mandy Newberry giving you some props right now. A lot of comments coming in. Uh, Kevin Yancey, I'll get to your comment here in a matter of moments. I'll throw this to you. Do you feel Charlottesville was set up for well for the launch of your business? Do you th- Here's a different way of asking that question. I ask a lot of entrepreneurs this question, and the answers vary. Is this a good community to launch a business? Reasons yes and reasons no. Well, A, I don't have anything else to compare it to because it's my okay. only business, but I, I'll say this. I think um, when I first started, I was really nervous about getting all the legal you know the LLC mm-hmm. and having all the permits and of course you just you learn that as you go yeah right it's not it's not hard that ends up being the easy part it's yeah, yeah. it's the easy part yeah. um here's what I'll say with Charlottesville so I think I think we have definitely a lot of fans in Charlottesville okay one of the things I've had to work on with this business is we do really well with tourists okay right so obviously we have history in our name and yeah Charlottesville gets a lot of history tourists going to you know Monticello or you know, Monroe's home or maybe Madison's home. Um, and so we, we do really well with folks. They go up and do Monticello during the day, and then they get to do a Monticello-themed escape room at night, and then they go out, you know, they go out to eat. So we do really well with tourists. But what we, what we kind of think we struggled with and what I'm, I'm trying to work on is getting our name out there to the locals. Because on Allied Street, I think it's a great shopping plaza, but it's not a, it's not a walkable shopping plaza. You're not... 
it's not one you're typically like window shopping with compared to something like the downtown mall. And so we're, you know, in some ways we're a little hidden over there. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, I, I think, I think once you do an escape room at one of our escape rooms, you, you become a fan because they are a lot of fun. If you look at our Google reviews, I mean, we have a perfect 5.0 rating with over 800 reviews. That's awesome. Right. And we have, we get about, we probably average a three or four star review once a year and probably a hundred or 200 five star reviews. Congratulations. And, and, and we're not paying for those. Yeah. But I think, I think if you, if people try it out, they become a believer and it is, it is immersive entertainment. So you're not, you know, it gets kids away from Amen. the, the ta you know, the tablets, yeah. the screen time. Right. It's an, it's an entertainment option where Grandma and Grandpa can have fun with their nine and ten year old grandkids, and they're in both are ha both are having a blast. That's awesome. So it's a good multiple multiple generation type entertainment. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm. I think I think we are positioned to succeed in Charlottesville. I think it is the right city, the right size for for what we want to do for the business. Um, your mom's giving you some props. Oh, Gail's thank watching. you, mom. <laughs> Says I love you, Phil. I mean, so if, your proud mom, of this guy. if your mom doesn't, uh, this is your mom. I amen. Mom, it, you yeah. know. <laughs> well, well, Gail, thank you for watching the program. Uh, Uncle Dan's giving you some props too. Uh, he says, this guy is someone we're so proud of. He's smart. He's driven. His priorities are in the right place. Our family is so proud. Uh, Thanks, Uncle Dan. You got uh, folks in Richmond, Fluvanna, Orange, Green, Culpeper, Madison watching the program right now. Short Pump, hello. Uh, some Northern Virginia watching the program. What'd you make of the article in the Daily Progress that came out? And if you didn't read it, I'll give you kind of like... Yeah, I think I read this. The yeah. Nightcraft, the ahead. tourism Go one. Ahead. yep. Yeah, so $956 million tourism impact in Charlottesville and Albemarle County in 2023. $956 million. Tourism supports more than 7,000 jobs in the area. What I tried to do earlier in the week was compare the 956 million economic impact with tourism and the 7,000 plus jobs with your former uh, line of work, the defense sector, that has a 1.2 billion yearly impact and interestingly, roughly the same amount of jobs, 7,000 yeah. plus. The point I made, and I, you're a brilliant guy, I can tell here, the point I made was the jobs that come with the defense sector are jobs that are you know, six-figure jobs. Let's yeah. just say six-figure. I know they're not all, but let's just yeah. call them six-figure jobs. The jobs that come with tourism, right around, a lot of them right around minimum wage. Yeah. Um, so I try to compare and contrast the impacts of a booming tourism industry with a booming defense sector industry all here in Charlottesville and Elmore County. Anywhere you want to go on this. Yeah, I mean, I think it's healthy for Charlottesville to have different sectors and you're not so dependent on one. And I think, I think you're absolutely right. Like the, the defense sector, you're going to have very healthy incomes. Um, but, you know, one advantage with the tourism industry is it's a lot of outside money. So it's money coming from Richmond, D.C., North Carolina. Um, they... It, they don't tax our roads. They don't tax our schools. They give us their money and they leave. Exactly. You know, and there's a lot of lodging taxes, right? And so that, that pays for, you know, the, the, the city and the county get a lot of money from, the, from those lodging taxes. And so there's definitely, there's definitely some benefits there. And look, for a, for a healthy economy, you need jobs at different pay rates. Like you can't, you can't have, you can't, it can't all be in one sector. It's not, it's not healthy, you know, if it, it creates resilience. Um, Look, with, with tourism, I mean, I do have a concern with his, historical tourism, and that's... What's your concern? Well, you know, look, Charlottesville, obviously Monticello is a big draw. Um, I was talking to, uh, I, I won't mention who, but you look at Colonial Williamsburg, and you, you know... I grew up in Williamsburg. The, the numbers of people doing historical tourism... They are dropping. Big time. Um, and in, in Charlottesville, obviously not as affected as Colonial Williamsburg and Jamestown, but, uh, but you know, it is concerning. And one of the reasons I, I didn't, when I created the escape room, I didn't go in wanting to do necessarily historical escape rooms, but I saw, I saw how, how good it would be to have a Monticello, Thomas Jefferson themed escape room. It's just smart marketing, frankly, to kind of tie into that. And then I decided to brand around it. Like I could use the Edgar Allan Poe, his time at UVA. And I, and I kind of mix and match between local, local history and U.S. history, and now I'm branching out to world history with Leonardo da Vinci. Um, but uh, I think one advantage my business has is that it does make history fun. So 
my number one goal has got to be fun, and if you learn a little history, great. Sometimes these, uh, these historical uh, museums, they can get a little boring for kids. Stodgy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, don't get, I, I went to Monticello. I did a team building activity a couple of weeks ago with, with, my, with my staff. I had a blast. I, I, I think Monticello does a great job. But you have an affinity for it. I do have an affinity. But I've, I've done some historical attractions, and I got a history background. Yeah. I'm kind of bored. And so if I'm bored, what does that mean for someone who's not as much into history as I am? But, uh, but with something like an escape room, it, uh, it, it makes history fun. And it makes you kind of, you feel a little smarter. Like, not only did I have fun, but I learned a little bit about the Jack and Jewett ride, you know? So we use that as the story when, when they were coming to capture Governor Thomas Jefferson and his wife. Um, and, the t- you know, Edgar Allan Poe, he gets you, oh, mate, that escape room was really fun. I want to read The Raven. I want to read The Black Cat or The Cask of Amontillado or, uh, you know, Virginia Hall, we, our, our World War II spy escape room. She was our top spy in France during the war. And, um, you know, there are a lot of good books on her. There's a, some, some halfway decent movies, but it allows you to kind of take pride in your country again um, for, you know, certainly the British are coming and, uh, and the Allied spy. So, so I, try to, I try to make history fun again. That's what I'm trying to do. Uh, I, I want to ask you this question. This is going to be the hardest question I ask you. <clears throat> Why do you think the affinity or the participation in U.S. history in some cases, maybe uh, dwindling with interest. I'm gonna, and before I want to get to some comments here because I think yeah. you're gonna want to think about this answer, and then I'm <laughs> gonna follow it up by saying, you mentioned Jack Jewett. A lot of American history being whitewashed from history. What you and I learn, we're roughly the same age, in AP U.S. history is gonna be very different than what your three kids and my two kids learn in AP U.S. history. Um, yeah, it's true. Bill McChesney, for my wife's birthday, we went. There were six of us. The person that was our guide was extremely helpful. The only problem we had uh, were two, there, some people were too rowdy, and she asked, uh, the guide asked for that group to hold it down. But then again, we were a group of 70 year olds, he's saying, watching the program. Vanessa Park Hills, watching the program. I was just talking with my daughter the other day about one of the things that differentiates entrepreneurs from other smart folks who do not make that choice. A huge factor is risk tolerance. Also, even if you're a lawyer, engineer, or doctor, doing those things on your own without an IT or HR or marketing department adds a huge layer of complexity to your work life that can look very scary and outside of your area of expertise. Big props, she says, to small business owners out there. She's in the payroll and bookkeeping and accounting business for small business and uh, entrepreneurs. So the history question for you. And then Kevin Yancey's got a defense question for you about Peters Mountain and Keswick. If any perspective you can offer about Peters Mountain, um, I would be learning from that as well because I'm not sure what he means by that. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know what I don't know what Peters Mountain. If he's able yeah. to provide some more context, yeah. then maybe maybe I can chime in. I but think this is uh, what is uh, uh, almost, uh, and, and I think I'm sure it does exist, but like a defense compound um, that's very under the radar here. But I don't know much about. It. But history question for you: the changing yeah. nature of history participation with history, and the whitewashing potentially of history. You know, I'm actually going to, let me share a story. When I was in Germany, right, obviously the Germans with World War II history, they're ashamed of, you know, the, the Nazism of their country. And I remember, I remember we visited Luxembourg, and we visited a, 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 a military cemetery, you know, and it's just sort of powerful. You just take a lot of pride in your country when you see all the people who sacrificed for it to give you the freedoms you have. And I remember there was another, there was another nearby cemetery with um, Nazi soldiers and, and, you know, where they were buried. And, of course, you know, Nazism is terrible. Everyone agrees on that. But what struck me is that it's kind of sad. It was kind of sad for me on one respect that they, you know, even though what they were defending was wrong, they were still fighting for their country. Even I, 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 can, I don't want to be taken out of context here because Nazism is the worst thing. I, I, I fully condemn it. But it was kind of sad that the Germans, the only time they could get excited for their country was around soccer matches. That's it. That's, a, that's about all the patriotism I saw when I living in Germany. And we're not nearly like that in the U.S., but I definitely see the patriotism and just sort of the, the pride in one's country. We all agree with the problems we've had. Slavery, 
civil rights and all that. Look, no, no one is wrong about that. But you see all the people that want to come to our country. When you've seen other countries, when you've been able to live in third world countries, and you know, I, I, I lived in Egypt when I was in college. I studied abroad in Egypt. And you, you see how good our country is. I think sometimes we take that for granted. And it's kind of sad um, that we don't really have the same patriotism that I remember growing up in the 80s and 90s. You know, uh, I think that's 100% true. Um, I, we did a show on this. On, I've been here 24 years. And in the 24 years that I've been here, where I went from troublemaking first year at UVA to now a father, business owner, homeowner, two kids, wonderful wife. Like it's, I became a, you know, still trying to figure out how to become a man, but became a man here in a lot of ways. 24 years ago, 4th of July, awesome parade in McIntyre Park, fireworks, patriotism, community, uh, community uh, zest, mm -hmm. uh, community passion, dogwood parade was awesome, went right down Market Street. We would watch a decade plus ago from our office upstairs. The first night, Virginia, the family mm -hmm. event on the downtown mall that celebrated uh, New Year's Eve, mm -hmm. uh, that was not booze centered, mm -hmm. it was kid centered. All these are going away. Yeah, they're going away. I've said that there seems to be a lack of like community um, commitment to community. Maybe part of that is that the quality of life in our home, Charlottesville, and Elmore County, is so wonderful that's, that it's attracted a. Uh, a lot of transplants or, or, or new folks to the area that may not have the same commitment to buy local, shop local, even if it costs a little bit more than online, or volunteer for the Dogwood Parade. We've had nonprofits say that volunteerism is down. Ginny Hu, who watches on Twitter, says volunteerism is down. She's involved in a lot of that stuff. Yeah. It seems yeah. to me that there's this missing commitment to community um, anywhere you want to go on this topic. And why is that the case? Maybe yeah. why is that the case? Well, I, I think, you know, our natural selves are selfish, right? And so... Natural selves are selfish. I, That's I so think, true. you know, like I'm a person of faith and... and Me too. I think, uh, I think the natural tendency for just human nature is to be selfish. And so if there's, for whatever reason, we're always going to be angling toward that. Uh, I think it's just, just our nature. Um, but... Uh, you know, look. I mean, it's it's sad that it's sad that fireworks on July Fourth is not happening all over the country. And 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 you don't have organizations who are either donating it or people who are like, "I'll do this." this is you know, this is worth doing just to just to contribute to it. Uh, I think that's sad. I you know, my kids are in public schools, um, and I you know, I ask them, you know, what are you learning in in school? And, um, and look, I'm. I'm 50-50 with the public schools, right? You know, I'm keeping them in there, but <laughs> of course 50 /50? I have concerns. Look, I think, <laughs> I, you know, I want to be careful here because I don't want to throw anyone under the, under the bus, including my kids. But uh, oftentimes, like with the social studies or the history, I ask, well, you know, what are you learning about? Uh, I'm trying to remember what the specific issue was, but it's so many negatives about the country. And of course, we should be teaching why, how we can improve. Absolutely, we should be teaching that. But I think it's swayed so much to it's like 80% negative and 20% positive when it should be closer to 50-50. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, uh, I don't know, it's just sort of the, the cultural trend that we're in where it's, it's easy to, to put down our country. I, I remember, look, I mentioned earlier, 9-11 had a huge impact on me. Were you just before college or freshman I was, in college? I was, uh, Syracuse? No, I was, I think, a junior in high school. Okay, okay, so just before you go to Syracuse. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember that day I told my mom, I'm like, I'm, I, wanna, I wanna go in the military. Wow. And uh, now I had asthma as a kid and a teen, and so it just that, that route didn't go, but I still... I still ended up working for a military organization, deployed around the world, um, still doing defense, and so I still was able to fulfill that dream. But uh, I, I lament that it will, it might take another 9/11 to create that unity up in D.C. between Republicans and Democrats, but not just not it's just terrifying. between politicians. It's it's sad that that's what it would have to come yeah. to. And now I don't even know if that would be enough. I mean, of course, I don't want that to happen, but it's it's uh, you know, I remember. I remember the patriotism uh, that, you know, I, I didn't live through Pearl Harbor and I didn't th live through a lot of uh, proud moments in our country, but uh, 
Um, I will never forget how unified our country was after 9-11 and how, how willing people were to sign up for the military, to sign up for public service, uh, to give back to something besides themselves. Dude, you just and, gave me goosebumps. I love, I didn't think the interview was going to go in this direction. 100% agree. Um, I've said on our show, our oldest is, is in a private school and it's, it's expensive. Yeah. Um, and, and the decision was made in a lot of ways because some of the stuff that you're saying, um, and, and I understand that the schools are doing the best they possibly can with what they got. Um, but it's a, a, a curriculum, you know, when the governor, when, when, when Terry McAuliffe, who was running for governor says that parents should not be involved in their kids' public school education, not once, twice, but three times, while trying to win the top seat in the Commonwealth of Virginia. I was flabbergasted. Mm -hmm. lost, he lost the election because of that yeah. statement. But that statement embodies a lot of what folks think. Um, and it, it, it disenchanted us, my wife included, to the point where we made, are making this decision of where to put our oldest and eventually our youngest. Um, I'll close with this, 45 minutes in on, on, on this interview. Would you do, if you had your druthers, would you have done this business, this escape room in the Charlottesville, Almoral, Central Virginia area again? Well, you know, now that I know... Because you probably could have done it. <laughs> yeah. You know, here's the thing. Now that you know how much work it takes, yeah. there's, of course, a part of me like, man, I remember how easy my Saturdays were. Or, you know, <laughs> life was in many ways a lot easier. But I would say absolutely I would do it again. I think, I think uh, you know, this is an incredibly fun ride. I, I uh, you know, of course, I, I have some big aspirations for the future. Not exactly, we're, we're sure, not exactly sure where I'll end up, but uh, I would absolutely do it. I mean, this is, it's a fun business. I, it's a growing business. Um, it, is, it is a way to provide entertainment that's clean, that's family friendly. Screen free. Screen free. Most appealing thing for me, the screen free yeah. with our kids. Yeah, and, and you don't have kids. You don't have kids asking, hey, you know, mom and dad, you know, 30 minutes in the escape room. They want to come and do another escape room. They're not asking about, hey, can I get on the iPad and watch some Netflix or something? My kid asked me, this is terrifying, on a regular basis, can I get an iPhone 16? He's six years old. <laughs> asked me that yesterday. Said, how do you even know about this? It's through ads on YouTube. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's, it's sad. The screen free is incredibly appealing. Um, VP says, thank you, Philip, for your service to our country. Patriotism may be waiting around here, but it's alive and well and surrounding counties um, and throughout our country. Multiple people saying thank you for your service. Thank you for what you're doing. Steve Belcher, thank you for watching the program. Uh, closing thoughts. Please plug the business. Please plug sure. location. Everything. So, you crush this, dude. Yeah. The, uh, uh, you can find out more, unlockedhistory.com, or just mm -hmm. search for Unlocked History Escape Rooms, and it will show right up. We are opening Leonardo da Vinci's awesome. uh, escape room next Friday. So Black Friday, it's one of our busiest weekends of the year. So we will sell out probably of all of our escape rooms, both on Friday and Saturday, and probably a little bit on Sunday or close to it. Um, but yeah, you can book online right now. Um, we are, look, we're going to be around for several years, and we're, we're going to be building new escape rooms, both local history, world history. I think uh, we're leaning <coughs> towards a local murder mystery that happened in 1903. Do you ever hear about the, uh, the mayor's wife who died <coughs> on Park Street? Did you ever hear that story? When... The mayor's wife died on Mayor Park. Mayor McHugh was the mayor of Charlottesville. Okay. Is this Frank McHugh? Um, it might, it might, I'm thinking John McHugh, but okay. I have to look. Is, is to, this of the McHugh Center? Well, I know there's a lot of McHugh family members, yeah. and we're, we're leaning towards this, but his, his wife died, and actually the mayor was found guilty of the crime. Okay. Um, so we're thinking of making that, you know, make it family friendly but kind of like a clue, murder mystery, you're police detectives and you kind of have to crack the case. Love this. So allow people to kind of enjoy some of the local history, but in a fun way. You know, we don't want it too dark. Um, so we're going we're gonna to hopefully start that come, come the new year. But uh, yeah, if you haven't tried it out, I, th I, I ask everyone, give it one escape room a try. And if you don't like it, you don't have to do another one. But, you know, I'm convinced that if you've done one, you're going to want to come back. 
Phil was absolutely fantastic, Judah. Judah Wickhauer behind the camera. His name's Phil Reese, and he carried the show today as I battle whatever my kid brought home from daycare. Um, his brand is something we should support. I support any business owner that is getting in the small business game, the local game, and I want you guys to support Phil Reese and what he's doing over in McIntyre Plaza. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, a, hap uh, a random encounter. Is it happenstance encounter? Judah Wickhauer on the downtown mall, and it leads 48 hours later to this interview, and it's one of the things I absolutely love about Charlottesville, Virginia, guys. My name is Jerry Miller. For Phil and for Judah, thank you kindly for watching the I Love Seville show. So long. Phil, you killed it. He's going to tell us when the uh, cameras...